Hey folks, thanks for joining me for this episode from the Embellished Pod. It's an opportunity for me to ramble about whiskey or something for a few minutes. If you got here by chance, please take a moment to hit the subscribe button. Hopefully I can be found on any podcasting platform that exists. And if you can't find me on a platform, send me an email at embellishpod at gmail.com and I'll get that taken care of. You can also find video versions of this podcast on YouTube. You can find all of my links on Instagram at embellishpod or TikTok with the same handle. I have a website. It is www.embellishpod.com. It's also a place to pick up these links, episode details, and more. Uh, Today, we're going to have the wonderful opportunity to talk to Mark from Waterford Whiskey, uh, which is an Irish whiskey brand out of Ireland. Um, And they're doing some really amazing things with terroir, traceability, sustainability. And um, I really hope you enjoy today's conversation. This morning we have Mark joining me from Waterford. Um, thank you, Mark, for your time. I want to give you, uh, you know, a couple seconds. Just t- tell me a little bit about Waterford before we dive into the nitty gritty of it. Uh, Waterford, south- southern coast of Ireland, same latitude as uh, Cambridge, you know, almost London. So, uh, two hundred and forty miles south of Isla, where I used to be at Brooklady uh, when I set that up in two thousand. Um, so I went south following the barley. Um, you know, barley is, is the origin of whiskey's flavor. Um, 2,000 flavor compounds. It's the most flavorsome cereal in the world. Um, it's what makes single malt whiskey the most beguiling, compelling spirit of all. Um, so it makes sense to, to go where the best barley in the world grows. That's why I'm there. And you mentioned this just, just for a second. Um you seem to be a bit of a, a cereal brand creator um, or revivalist, right? So you revive the Brook Laddie. Um, yeah, and cereal. So there's there's even some, you know, there's there's cereal in the continuous nature and then cereal in the barley. So it's, you know, it's a play on words. But, um, you know, and, and you it, you sold Brook Laddie. When you started Waterford, were you, are you building this with the intent to eventually sell it? Or is this now a passion project? Uh, you've made your money now. You can go play. I, I mean, the thing—the thing with the thing with Brook Laddie is, well, first of all, I, did, I didn't want to sell it. Uh, um, mm-hmm. I was completely out, uh, um, done at the time. It was very sad. Um, we had more things still to do that we hadn't put in place, which which um, was annoying. Bearing in mind how hard and difficult it was to, you know, have got that uh, to the you know, to where we did. Um, so I was I was really rather frustrated. Um, so, so Waterford is a chance to actually sort of clear the decks and do it properly um, with the right logistics, with the right uh, um, uh, um, systems in place. And um, barley is an agricultural produce. You know, it's 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 agricultural. Um, mm-hmm. You know, it's, it's not like a you know you know some some um, well to me it's not a commodity. Uh, to be purchased on a global uh, uh, market from the cheapest place in the world. It's it, it's a very fundamental source of, of, of barley's flavor. And, you know, if you go back to how whiskey used to be made, um, you know, the very origins of it, um, you know, it was one man band. You know, it was a guy, you know, feeding his family, uh, growing some barley um, you know, to feed his family, to feed his cows. Um, and to distill for himself. And, you know, that was the very origins of it, going back to the Middle Ages and before, possibly back to the Viking times. Um, And it's, you know, there's a different story altogether, but they're quite possibly the Vikings that brought distilling uh, and the knowledge of it back from the Middle East. Um, And Vikings set up Waterford, um, you know, that was founded in 942 by the Vikings. so, 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 you know, I think you know those origins of subsistence farming, and then how it changed into, you know, by legislation into farm distilleries. Um, in other words, you know, stopping the the you know, the one man band operations and consolidating it into, uh, um, you know, established licensed uh, farm distilleries, and then those got bigger and. You know, you, you can see the progress, you know, and, and uh, um, you know, my contention is that it was always about the barley. It always was. It always should be. Um, and really what we're doing at Waterford is taking it back to that origin. 
except not one farm, you know, 110 farms um, we've distilled since we started. Um, so, you know, 110 origins of barley, each with their own terroir defined flavor profiles. Um, and, you know, so, 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 you know, Waterford as a, as a techno modern uh, brewery um, gives me the, the equipment and the ability to extract those terroir derived barley forward flavors. Um, unlike anybody else, and that's why I, I, that's why we're at Waterford because there was this this super modern uh, brewery there, um, and of course, to anybody, you know, brewing is where it all starts. It's how you liberate the flavors that are in the grain, uh, um, and that's brewing, mashing, milling, fermenting, brewing. <laughs> that's what it is, you know. Uh, um, so, so having a, a super modern brewery is, 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 has been my aim all along. To, you know, to have that um, uh, ability, the temperature control and uh, um, mash filters, and and the world's only hydro mill, which allows us to mill anaerobically, thereby preserving the barley aroma that's normally lost in in a mill house. Um, so, so it, you know. You know why I'm in Waterford is is because of this brewery being available, mm -hmm. the best barley in the world. Um, the distilling bit's actually easy. Uh, you know, contrary to everybody's um, indoctrination, it's 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 not about master distillers and alchemy and mystery. It's it's, it's schoolboy chemistry. It's very simple. Uh, so mm -hmm. we distill Scottish way, double distillation in stills that I stole from. In Verleven on the River Clyde. In fact, I sold them twice. I stole them also from Brook Um So, so it's you know double distillation. I'm not interested in any triple or other mixed mash, mixed cereal stuff. You know, for me, double with barley is the ultimate. So I'm making single malt whiskey in Ireland because they've got the best barley in the world. And you, you sort of touched on this, and I think this is the thing that makes whiskey the most interesting spirit to me is, um, and, and I've said this a number of times, um, whiskey mirrors the industrialization of the world, right? Um, it started off as a very small boutique operation on farm distillery. People were distilling for themselves. And then as um, farming became more industrialized and you were able to produce more grain then you could consume and that grain then created more whiskey than you could individually consume. Then you start uh, commodifying the whiskey and you get rid of it. Um, and eventually, you know, in, in, in all things industrial, we build to this place where there's industrial farms and there's industrial grain alcohol. And then um, people become detached from their consumer cycle of whatever it is that they're eating or drinking. And then we start to revert back to wanting to be very, very specifically tied to what we're doing. Um, and so, We've seen this in, at least in North America, in food, um, in beer, and a host, host of other things. We're now going back in the other direction where we want smaller, more attached to the land offerings and solutions in a time when uh, technology has never been greater. And now our technology can get smaller. And so you can do exactly what you're doing, which are these um, single farm origins. And it's um, a really interesting exploration of terroir. Um, and... I do want to ask you about that term terroir, you know, for, for whiskey, sh should we be developing a new term instead of terroir? Because you know, terroir has its distinct connotations in wine. Um, but with whiskey, there's this other bit around, you know, local yeast and how do you age it and distilled product being clean. You know, there may be a little more complexity to terroir with whiskey than there is to wine or am I off base here? Well, that's an awful lot. You've, packed into that um little bit uh, um the first bit you go back to the uh, um the, the, you know the social thing about sort of people wanting to know where their food comes from i mean that, i think that's a direct correlation to advertising and monopolies it, you know it, it creates you know I, I mean, it, and it normally starts at the top and it works its way to the bottom uh, we've seen it with brewing we've seen it with with, with you know with with, with all sorts um, um, so you got you got that as a sort of social thing, um, and, and then of course the, the more um, a sector 
develops and grows, it throws off more uh, um, levels of, you know, interest and intrigue. I mean, we all know that the big guys get very big because they've done the whole thing down to, you know, a, um, a standard level, um, which is easy to produce. Don't upset, you know, the, the, you know, the app part. Keep everybody sort of, you know, uh, um, you know, like middle of the road music sort of thing, you know. Mm -hmm. um, you, you're going to appeal to a wider audience, but you're not going to you, you're not going to make them love it. But you you're not going to offend anybody, and I think that's that's sort of where we are with whiskey. Um, whereas, you know, what it then does is people that are interested go, well, hold on a second, surely we can do better than this. What about that? What about this? You know, and that's when you start getting a stratification, uh, um, and then the marketing guys lump, jump on that because they can see they can make more money. Uh, um, so, 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 you know, there's there's a sort of economic and a social and an intellectual stratification, and one follows the other, or does it? Mm -hmm. I don't know. Yeah, that's that. Uh, and the other bit you, you asked me about was um, um, about Tewa. It never ceases to amaze me uh, um, that this this one word can cause such confusion. Now, some of it's deliberate confusion. Some of it is uh, um, troublemaking. Some of it's uh, ignorance. Some of it's opportunism. Um, but, but I mean, I mean, just the other day, there's a, a London uh, um, uh, wine magazine, and and there was a whiskey person uh, was talking about um, his suspicion that Tewa can't exist. Um, that if you took a wine, if you took a distillery and you transplanted it from position A to position B, um, the whiskey would still be the same. Now that's, you know, to carry that analogy forward, you know, if you took Romani Conti and you moved it from, you know, Von Romani and stuck it in the Sahara Desert, I can tell you one thing, it ain't gonna be the same, you know, because it's about the, you know, it's that unbelievable, you know, deliberate ignorance about what terroir is. Now, mm -hmm. you know, it's been, uh, the trouble is because there's no sort of English language direct translation, it's it's open to a, a misinterpretation. Um, the word sounds, as it implies, it's to do with ground, it's to do with uh, um, a, a place, um, but not anything generic. It, it's what happens that you know the true definition of terroir is being used you know enlarged to mean regions to re to mean uh, uh, styles of cheese and you know whatever um but the true definition is is what happens to a plant that's the that, that's the real you know, accepted definition it's the microclimate the soil and the topography working on the nourishment of a plant, any plant. Your mother knows it as gardening. It's the same thing. You know, you know we know that sandy soils, you know, certain plants grow better. Acid soils, azaleas and fuchsias and, and, and wet soils, hydrangeas, you know, you know north facing walls, not so good. South facing walls, great for roses. This is terror. It's microclimate, soils, and the topography on a plant, what it does to a plant. Not a person, not a distillery mm -hmm. or a brewery or a, you know, a, 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 a winery. It's what happens to the plant. And if you don't get that, you know, and, and, and this is why I thought this, this dullard a, 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 um, uh, decanter, it, it, you know, you shouldn't really be writing about this stuff. You know, it's, it's, mm -hmm. it's, it's not that complicated. Um, so, so you know, and, and if you apply um, the same thing to a distillery, if you go back, as I said, to to the Middle Ages, where you had sort of a um, one man subsistence farming, um, and barley was being grown to feed the cows, to you know, to make bread, um, and some of it was distilled. On Isla, we know that it got out of hand, as you were implying. It, you know, more of it was being distilled than was feeding, um, you know, these larger families that were growing, you know, as a result of 
uh, um, you know, having come up with medical advances that stopped a lot of these children dying at birth. So families were getting bigger, but more of the crop was being diverted <laughs> into distilling. So that you know, Isla had a problem; it had it had a real issue. Uh, um, but but you know, the, the idea of the 1823 uh, Excise Act was was to try and stop or stamp out that um, individual distilling and and get it done by somebody that could be licensed. If you license them, you can make some money from them. You know, revenue. You knew where they were, and that's what happened. That's what the 1823 Licensing Act was about. There'd been various false starts trying to control it. This was the best option. Everyone can distill, but two rules. You've got to buy a license. That will be £10. And your still has to be at least 200 gallons. Right? In other words, stop all your local individual distilling stuff. Somebody go legit. We can tax them. We know where you are. And that's what happened. And, of course, the question is, who went legit? Well, the guy with the barley went legit. The guy that had the better fields, he had the better soils, he had the better ability to grow barley, the primary raw ingredient, and he was the guy that chucked out the cows, shoehorned in the biggest pot still he could fit into a Hebridean stable, um, and you know the, the, the you know the rest is history. So 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 I think that's you got to sort of wind back to you know how, how it all started um and then of course those farm distilleries got bigger and bigger and bigger until eventually the you know, consolidation you know they were bought up shut down capacity transferred to to bigger more efficient distilleries and that happened in waves you know well, you know one of the big ways for that was the the oil opec oil crisis of 73 saw 15 distilleries shut down uh, um to the extent that you end up with not very many farm distilleries at all. Now, you know, Isla, Bunahav and Brookladdy were both built the same year as farm, uh, sorry, not as farm distilleries, but as industrial distilleries um, because the economics changed, because all of a sudden you could transport um, the two necessary thing, which is coal to fire your stills and dry your barley. And barley itself. So, so you know, the economic imperatives changed with the advent of steam commodity transport. Um, and, you know, the end, you know th that was sort of really heralded the end of farm distilleries, certainly on Ireland, um, until, you know, Kilhoman and sort of Arden Hoish things happened um, in the last sort of 15 years or so. Does that make sense? You know, it yeah, no, it absolutely makes sense, and I, you know, I think we see at least in agriculture in North America, you know, a series of consecutive tough farming years, what leads to farm consolidation, in the same way that a series of of tough selling years for distilleries leads to 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 con consolidation of distilleries as well, and so you have less choice, and you have all of these problems. Do you, do you think that it's fair to say? that the farther the grain or, or the distillate gets from the soil that it was grown in, the harder it is to capture that terroir, right? And so if you're shipping the grain, you know, 500 miles away, or how many well, other so kilometers like, that is, I can't do the it, conversion. It's, 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 it's when it gets mixed up with everything else, uh, mm -hmm. uh, um, you know, when it becomes a commodity. I mean, I mean, buying, if, if you go to most distilleries, you know, uh, um, they don't even know where the barley comes from. Uh, mm -hmm. It's just you pick up a phone and it gets delivered. It, 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 you know, it'll be coming from the Ukraine, or be coming from you know Australia. It doesn't matter. This this is why nobody talks about it because it, it, part of it, it, you know, it's irrelevant. It's just where it is of the best quality, uh, the best economic return. Um, that's the driving force. Um, so so that link with terroir, that link with plates, was cut. Back in the 19th century, you know, in the Brook Lady, but Harvard was almost, you know, you could argue, you could argue that that was part of the problem. You know, that was, that was, you know, ending that, that local, uh, I mean, Isla at the time had 20 distilleries, 20 little wee distilleries doing, you know, 70, 50, you know, thousand liters. 
and that was all the island could produce barley wise until you know the the, the, the economics changed and um it, you know the advance of steam power and, and and commodity vessels flat bottom vessels that could bring um you know to the rocky shores of isla you know and land on the beach at high tide be offloaded at low tide and float away again afterwards you know that was a you know that was the game changer there for isla um, you know for elsewhere in scotland it was the railway um that did it mm -hmm. um and then of course you you know in ireland you've got you know the loss of well, two things. One, one is, is is independence, which heralded the loss of access to the British Empire. And the second, three years later, was prohibition in America, and that was the end. That was the death knell for for, for Irish distilling. So, so you know, you know, who who could have foreseen? Well, I suppose you could have foreseen the former, but not the latter. Uh, mm -hmm. um, so, you know, there are these other socio-economic, political issues that come into play as well but tower and tower is, is what happens to the barley uh, um mm -hmm. it, it, you know it's it's like the vine uh, um if i take um uh, for example if you transfer it to what if i i have a winery in 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 you know in ireland and i'm importing grapes from chile uh, um what is it that i'm making uh, um does it have a tower Mm -hmm. well, no, it's just generic international grapes, or, you know, from wherever in in in, in Chile. The, the you know the principle of of, of terroir is this localization. It's it's microclimate. The clues in the name, microclimate, mm -hmm. topography. You know, you know, steep hills or slopes or flat slopes prone to bogging. Uh, um, uh, north facing slopes that are prone to frost. Uh, um, exposed slopes that get high evapotranspiration, uh, low-lying riverside ones that suffer from mildew and humidity. These these are the aspects you know uh, um, that affect uh, those two thousand flavor compounds growing in that barley grain. You know that's that that's the miracle I find. That little tiny little grain has got all that all that flavor. Mm -hmm. uh, let it out. Let it all out. That's what it's about. That's what we're doing at Waterford. Is I've got the, you know, this infrastructure. I've got the logistics to keep the farm separate. So, so you know, the thirty-five a year, you know, one hundred and ten that we've distilled, we can keep them all separate from the field to the bottle. Um, we've got our own dedicated uh, a malting facility. Um, you know, we we've got the traceability in place that we can uh, uh, follow it right the way through um and so instead of having 110 distilleries farm distilleries i've got 110 farm origins towers that we can distill at the one place in in a super modern way you know and you, you you're, you're set up uniquely, um, at least in, in my perception, uh, as a consumer product, right? Um, sustainability and organic farming are all, you know, significant marketing buzzwords in the industry, right? And in, in just about any uh, consumer goods industry. Um, but right now you have more specific information than many, many major players as far as um, the sustainable tracking of your stuff. I mean, you've, you've indicated this a number of times. You can get down to the farm from each bottle, and mm. that's not something that most folks can do in any industry. But so, so let's let's talk about that a little bit, right? Um, are well, you uh, sep – go ahead. Yeah, yeah. I, I, mean, I mean, you know, what I've just described. Uh, um, I mean, remember, you know, the, 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 the drinks industry, the spirits industry in particular, is, is a hugely – uh, uh, um, controlled uh, um, industry. I mean, the, the narrative, the whiskey narrative. Everything you know, your listeners know about about whiskey is is because the you know the the large players. That's what they want you to know. Mm -hmm. uh, um, so so you know, don't think too much. Just just take this, buy this, get on with it. You know, the mark is a mark. You know, it's, it's hugely marketing driven. Uh, mm -hmm. um, you know, Beth Diageo and Pernod Ricard, each, you know, in their whole groups, spend $4 million a year in marketing. I mean, it's, it's ginormous. 
Uh, um, and it's about producing the cheapest liter of alcohol possible and then making up a story about why you should drink it. And I come from a wine background and it comes back to the primacy of, of, of the raw material. Um, that's what I did at Brooklady. I showed that, that it is about the primacy of the raw uh, material, the barley, the most flavorsome cereal in the world, uh, um, and letting it do its stuff, let it showing you what it can do. Uh, um, you know, the, the um, I think the perception um, of our industry is is that um, you get what they what they tell you, um, and you know, organic and biodynamic. Um, that's not new. Mm. You know, it's, it's, you know, I'm not an eco warrior. You know, I'm not. No, I'm a natural flavor seeker. Mm -hmm. Everything was organic. Everything was biodynamic before the 1900s. It's not new. Fred Flintstone, you know, he didn't go down in his cart, you know, to the local farmer's market and stop up with agrochemicals and fertilizers. You know, they, everybody had to make do. Uh, um, and, and so, they, you know, this is, this is not new. Everything was organic, biodynamic before the advent of the agrochemical industry, which incidentally came out of the munitions industry, you know, the First World War. Um, so, so let's be clear about that. Um, it's not new. It's not some mm -hmm. eco lovey dovey save the world, you know, blah blah. It's because it produces natural flavors, and as I said, they're all there. It's just mm -hmm. let let them out naturally. Uh, so, so in fact, what we're finding is we, we Waterford, we're going backwards in time. I never intended to do this. We're going backwards. You know, of those 110 farms that we've distilled increasingly we're going organic farmers we started with six individual farmers we've now got 15 complete farms we've got three that are now biodynamic there were none uh, um mm -hmm. we, 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 we're now using uh, um four of our farms each year uh, uh we're peating them with irish peat that hasn't been seen for 100 years 105 years since um, since independence, uh, um, and of course, barley varieties. We're going backwards. We're going back to the future. We're going back to find out the flavors that were there mm -hmm. before the whiskey industry managed to incredibly neuter them. <laughs> mm -hmm. Accidentally, but that's what they managed to do. By picking two parents back in 73 that were cousins from which everything's been propagated ever since uh, uh, um you know and this we discovered when we did our terroir study you know the first proof uh technical proof that terroir exists don't take my word for it it's 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 a published peer-reviewed paper uh um you can see it on our waterford website um 2000 flavor compounds 60 percent of which are influenced by terroir there you go we all knew it there it is uh, um, so, so you know, I don't think it's um, it's not rocket science what we're doing. It's going mm. back to um, it's because we're interested in natural flavour, and of course, the questions that keep being asked is, well, what was barley like before they managed to neuter it? So, well, let's go and find out. Um, so, we're going back to barley varieties from. 1959, the Hunter, which we've got some in America at the moment, not very much though. Um, sensational. And you go, wow. <laughs> so this is what barley used to taste like before they neutered it. Unbelievable. Um, 1900, Goldthorpe. Uh, 1920, Spratt Archer. Um, 1870, the Middle Ages, Bear. Uh, um, you know, all, all the older varieties. That, and of course, you know, the, the, the question here is about barley varieties. Is and you'll know this too uh, from your, the, the work you do. The reason it's got two thousand flavor compounds is because barley mutates a lot, mm -hmm. and so for the last ten thousand years, it's done an awful lot of mutating, which is 
bringing all these flavor compounds together. I mean, you know, to put it in perspective, you know, you know, wines have about 500 flavor compounds. Um, cheese has 10. And we're talking about 2,000. So, you know, it's had a long time to, 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 and it's this propensity of mutating that does it. So Hunter, the one from 1959, you know, that was probably the missing link between indigenous wild barleys that had evolved naturally in their own terroir, their own environments, um, and had been brought together by Dr. Hunter to create this, uh, you know, spicy, uh, uh, um, you know, spicy, rich flavored uh, um, barley that, that is just, you, 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 you just think, well, what, what, why on earth did we give this up? No idea. You know, you, there's, there's, there's a. I do have an idea. Yeah, <laughs> so no, there, there, it was for for ever greater efficiency. So you know that no. whole seventy three onwards program was about increasing spirit yield, field yield, uh, uh, um, climate resistance, uh, climate adaptability, disease resistance. That's what it was about, um, mm -hmm. and, and and flavor just got forgotten. Yeah, it's, you know, you, you start entering into a time where, you know, the, the people who control the pocketbook make the decisions as opposed to the people who are concerned about flavor profiles. Um, and, you know, you make a really, really strong point that, you know, organic and biodynamic are not new ideas. Um, we're just starting to re-understand them, but they can often be used, you know, at least in North America, they're not legally defined. And so what it means could be anything, but with your particular structure, and being able to trace all of your farms, you can actually answer the degree to which you are organic or biodynamic, which many of the, yeah, you've, you've got the, it, you've got a, you've got a terroir code on the back. You can yeah. trace it all the way down to the farm. And, you know, I, I feel like that would be probably a monumental task for one of the larger um, distilling companies to do. But it also feels like that's going to be the trend that consumers are going to push for because we even see it here. In the yeah. states where some of the small distillers are, you know, challenging the idea that every distillery should probably have its own grain, right? Um, it, through land race gardening or whatever else, you identify what your local soil is. You identify some heirloom or older grain types that really fit that soil profile, and you're getting to the the best and most effective thing you can. And so, um, we're introducing these ideas of of traceability of of terroir, of, you know, local produce, whatever you want to call it. Um, I, I think the market is heading that way. And I, I don't know if you... I, I, you're right. It, it's heading that way, which is no bad thing. I, I, um, I mean, these heritage varieties, of course, oddly enough, um, it's not just the flavor that's so beguiling. Um, but of course, it begs the question of, you know, the economic efficiencies, you know, can you marry them? to modern varieties, low straw, low straw varieties. You know, yeah, that's where I'm going. I'm going to have my own, you know, greatest hits of barley um, of, of, of the past. You know, and that's, that's my aim, and I'm halfway there. Uh, um, you know, with Dr. Dustin Herb, you know, Oregon State University, I, I, you know, he's been helping me do this. Uh, um, so, so, yeah, it's about natural flavor. Um, we had it. We had lots more of it. Let, let's go and ferret it out and find where it is. But then, of course, it begs the other question, which is old-fashioned farming varieties, um, farming techniques. And guess what? They work better with old mm -hmm. varieties. You're matching. You know, we 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 have we have one biodynamic farmer that 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 you know, every year. You know, it's he really struggles. But when we gave him an old variety, he was off to the races. It, it, it was it was fantastic. So old farming techniques with old varieties, you know, of course, it it makes a lot a, a, a lot of sense. So we've we've spent a good deal of time talking about farming practices and um, traceability, biodynamic, organic. Um, and you've mentioned a few times some of the, the hydro milling and the mash filter and stuff. So let's let's talk about that just briefly, and then we'll um, head over to 
the whiskey, right? So we've talked about how to make the whiskey. Let's get to the whiskey eventually here. But um, you you mentioned a hydro mill, and um, I spent a lot of time sort of nerding out on that one because um, I, I can see a lot of advantages, and I'm curious why more people aren't using a hydro mill um, because I've been in a milling wow. facility before, and the sheer amount of dust that is in there um, is it's it's a fire hazard to begin with. But beyond that, if you think about it from your perspective, that's all lost flavor. Right. Yeah. Precisely. And, and so did, did, did you know you wanted a hydro mill or is it just, it came with the, the plant that you came bought with, and you figured out how to make it work? It came with, it came with, uh, uh, um, I, I mean, I mean you know, to, to finish off your previous point, the clue is we're dealing with an agricultural produce. We put it on the label. It's on the front label there. It's not a product. That's, that's a product. Okay, a manufactured right. product, a phone. It's an agricultural produce. Mm -hmm. It always was. And with me at Waterford, it is again. It's agricultural mm -hmm. produce. We need to remember that, you know. You know, uh, uh, it's an agricultural produce. It's of agriculture. Okay, that's that. Now, the hydro mill. Yeah, so when I had the chance to buy uh, this super duper uh, Willy Wonka uh, um, brewery, um, Guinness brewery, built in 2004, 40 million euros, amazing thing. I mean, it, it, you remember, I come from the wine world, uh, and you know, back then, back in the 80s, um, there was a big renaissance of the vineyards, you know, stimulated by you guys, you know, Americans, Australians, and the universities, Roseworthy's, Davis, um, and the French went there, they learned the science of winemaking and took it back to their old, uh, old world um, wineries and their lost terroirs, lost through excessive fertilizers, um, agrochemicals, cooperative winemaking, blah, blah, blah. And there was a renaissance. They linked modern winemaking, the science of it, with their historic tower and took off, you know, and, well, you know, the rest is, you know, as we know, a, a huge success. But, of course, you know, the technology in the cellar, uh, uh, um, you know, pneumatic pressing, uh, temperature control, stainless steel, uh, wood integration, uh, organics, biodynamics, all of this I was exposed to, and I've just applied this to another uh, agricultural produce, um, barley. So um, all distilleries tend to operate the same way. Um, the process is, you know, the, the mashing process, the milling, the mashing, uh, the fermenting tends to be pretty identical wherever you go. Um, I, I suppose you could divide it between the big, big players, you know, that go for a one-day high-density fermentation, time is money, um, distillation is speeded up, fermentation is speeded up, um, barley comes from where it's all about producing the cheapest litre of alcohol because it was always going to go into a blend until single malt took off. Um, so, so the process is, you know, they may have got a bit shinier, uh, and a bit flasher, but the principles are still the same. Um, so with Waterford, I actually had two breweries, one from 1792 on the left of the road, and then the modern one on the right. And uh, at the heart of the mashing milling process, fermenting was a lot of stainless steel and a lot of technology that I frankly had no idea whether it would work or not. Um, and if it didn't, I was going to import from the other side of the road the old mash tons, the old mills, the roller mills that I knew from my Brookladdy days. But as it was, we realized that this holy trinity of a hydro mill, incremental mash converter, and a mash filter actually gave us total terroir extraction. Um, now, the hydro mill works on the simple principle that you're putting water and uh, the barley together through the mill. So it's anaerobic. It's being milled without air. 
Um, and, and so it's a total mill. You're not looking for a grist, um, a grist which is necessary for a, a mash tun because you, you build a bed of grist in your mash tun and then you percolate hot water at incremental temperatures through the body of the grist. It's a percolation. And it flows through the bottom of the slotted uh, mash tun. This is, you know, this has been the, the, the principle um, everywhere. It hasn't really changed, except here at Waterford, um, Guinness decided to commission a hydro mill. It, it, it must have been for efficiency, um, but it was the only one I understand that was ever commissioned. It wasn't repeated, so perhaps it wasn't as effective as they thought. But for me, it's giving me this barley aroma. Now, you know, when you go to another distillery, which I did, um, and it was only when I was standing in the much loved mill, you know, at Brook Laddie, this fantastic roller mill, a bobby roller mill with all the big belts that drive it um, and the weighing uh, 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 units and, and, the, and the rhythmicness of the belts and the units and the buckets and the tipping. It, you know, it's a pretty funky place to be. It was one of my favorite places there. And it smells glorious. But that's just it. The mill house smells glorious. Mm -hmm. And that's what it occurred to me. That, that's, you know, that, that's, we're capturing all that. It's not escaping. That's why, you know, with Waterford, you can smell, it's, it all smells of barley. Heaven forbid. Mm -hmm. The primary roaring, and it actually smells of barley. So, 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 you know, that's what, one of the things the hydro mill does for us is it gives us that barley forward flavor. Um, and then, of course, you know, the, the incremental mash converter with, with, with 35 different origins a year ensures that we get mm -hmm. the, the right sugar conversion because um, you're heating the whole thing up like a saucepan. And then a mash, a mash filter that squeezes, um, you know, the, 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 the wort from uh, the residues of barley. And, of course, here that we're talking almost like sawdust. Um, and, of course, the pneumatically pressing it, like with wine, except instead of having one pneumatic press, I've got 54 in a row squeezing every last drop of terroir flavor from that barley. Now, I'm sure it wasn't designed to do that, but that's what it does for us. It repurposed this technology. Uh, um, so, And then, of course, we have the ability to temperature control the fermentation. Um, and I know that from my wine days, that the longer you ferment, the more intensity of flavor you get. So why not with barley? Um, mm -hmm. So we ferment for not one day, high density fermentation, not two days, which is what most of the whiskey industry does, but for eight days, you know, four times longer. Um, because we keep, like a surfer, we can keep the temperature low enough to extend the fermentation in a calm way. Um, and that gives us purer, um, you know, integrated flavors in more intense flavors. And get this, it means we have, I believe, the only malolactic fermentation in the spirit world. Now, malolactic fermentation is a, is, is a secondary fermentation that occurs after the alcoholic one mm -hmm. um, in the right conditions. And it converts harsh malic acid into softer lactic acid. Um, and it's well known in white wines. That's how you get sort of creamier white wines uh, rather than searingly acidic ones. Um, and that's what we do here. And so the middle register of the Waterford palate has a creaminess that you don't see anywhere else. So, 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 so yes, you know, this, this super duper um, brewery gives us um, the technology that I've always wanted to have to play with um, to do these things, temperature control uh, um, and 
get that extra middle register to the palate, a more complete palate than you'd ever find elsewhere. Um, and maximizing the terroir flavors and um, the barley aromas. You know, I, th I think, you know, it, it does the grain justice. And this is going to be one of those longer winded statements. Um, because if you're going to take the time to, to be that caring with the grain you're going to put in the soil, then you owe the responsibility to the grain once you're going to start the mash process. And the, the way I reconciled this is, and, and maybe this is the problem for Guinness, is that it was too effective, right? So they've got a pretty standard flavor profile and always have. And if you all of a sudden start extracting significantly more barley flavor, are they going to have a hard time creating a beer out of it? Because uh, it's not going to hit their standard profile, right? Like now you've got, you've turned it up to 13. You know, it was at 10, now you've asked, turned it up to 13. Yeah, I never asked the reason why, but, but, but uh, mm -hmm. uh, you, you know, you, you may be right, yeah. But it, it feels... The, the way I, because I, I spent a lot of time looking at this and it felt an awful lot like, um, you know, the coffee espresso analogy here where you're able to effectively control um, down to the finest you can get. And so with espresso, you want it to be fine. You want it to have pressure and you want to have appropriate heat, not too much, not too little, because if it's too much, it burns. If it's too little, it doesn't extract. And so you're effectively taking a very caring process on the front end. We haven't even mashed yet or we haven't even distilled yet right so we're making sure that everything is right and one of the unique things at least i, I saw in in y'all's approach is that you have a head of brewing and a head of distilling and those are two separate professional functions whereas at least in a lot of distilleries in the u.s one person does both and right. you know, i, I thought about same, you know it, same as well. it's same everywhere else but that yeah, is it's, exactly it's, it. every brewery it, every distillery used to have a head brewer we mm -hmm. do. And it feels like wine. Like, you know, it, it, I've always heard, you know, you don't ever cook with a wine you wouldn't drink. Right. And so you yeah. shouldn't ever distill with a beer that you wouldn't drink in the, in the same fashion. Right. You shouldn't take a, a beer that you're like, eh, you can't. it just uh, depends what your goal is. You know, uh, um, if, if your goal is to make the cheapest liter of alcohol possible, right. come hell or high water, then you speed the whole thing up. You, you, you mm -hmm. lower the cost of all your ingredients, wherever they are. You recycle the barrels. You, you, you know, everything is a, is a rush. Now, we know very simply from distilling purposes that if you speed up distilling, you get thinner spirit. You've tasted it. We've all mm -hmm. tasted it before. A thin spirit. It's because it's, it's been, you know, it's been produced at, at, at speed. Uh, um, you know, we know that if you slow it down, um, what we call a trickle distillation, if you just slow it right down to that middle cut, well, then you get more unctuous flavors. You get more oily, rich. You know, you see it in the legs when you hold up the glass. You know, you see it in the, you know, you've, it's mouthfeel. The French, the wine would call it gras. You know, the, the fattiness, the oily, rich, unctuous, umami sort of flavors. Well, that's just because we distill it very slowly, less than 300, 325 liters an hour. Um, you can see the viscosity coming out of the spirit set. Uh, um, and, I mean, you, you're absolutely period. right. The The legs on this particular whiskey, well, so I have three of, of y'all's whiskeys on hand, and, and the legs on them were pretty significant. And, you know, we have this we have this, this situation in the U.S. where with bourbon, you can absolutely hide thin distillate in, you know, new charred oak barrel aging, right? Because we have such significant barrel extraction the thinness can get buried because you have all of these powerful punchy flavors that sort of hide it. But um, taking the care in what is, in my opinion, um, a more delicate but more nuanced and flavorful approach is really, really, really evident, right? Because you, you've taken care of the crop, you have an agronomist on hand, you have a head brewer, you have a dis distiller, um, and then you're going to age it. And so we're going to go ahead and hop into the whiskey, right? We've, we've, we've talked for 48 minutes and really haven't talked about the whiskey offerings specifically. Right. And so you have the single farm origins and then more recently the cuvee, right? Well, yeah, um, single farms and, are, are the ingredients. They, mm -hmm. they, they're the building blocks. They are the terroir defined flavors. Okay. Uh, um, now we put those terroir defined flavors together to create the mind fuckery that is the cuvee concept. Uh, and this is, you know, I've, I'm ashamed, I, you know, hands up. I, I stole this idea from the French, uh, um, from the Champagne 
boys from the Bordeaux boys, the top Bordeaux chateaus, you know, the, the, you know, the Latours, the Lafitte's, the Petrus, Leoval Lascasse, they don't just harvest the whole vineyard and lump it all together and go, here you go, man. They, they, they do it all individually, like any great chef does. You know, you, 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 you have five varietals grown on optimized terroir around the estate. They're, they're, you know, vinif they're, they're cultivated separately, harvested, um, vinified, barreled separately. And then two years later, uh, like a great chef, they are assembled together um, by the maitre de chez to create the big wine. They put it on the label, you know, Latour, look up Chateau Latour. The first words you see are Grand Vin de, the big wine of Chateau Latour, because it's made up of 35, 40 little wines. It's the same as Champagne, Grand Cuvées, um, Grand Siec, they're, they're they're an assemblage, a bringing together of terroir-defined individuality to create multi-layers of flavor um, that are released in the glass um, for your enjoyment. So that's what I'm doing with whiskey. I'm giving you that multi-layered effect so that in your glass, as it warms up, as time goes by, as water reacts with those flavor compounds, um, it's going to release its flavors to you um, it, like a giant, ginormous dance of the seven veils. It's going to release those flavors layer by layer uh, um, for your maximum gratification. Uh, um, we've, we've layered them in so that they'll layer out in your glass. Uh, um, it, it, you know, it's, it's a sensual nuss of drinking single malt whiskey this is this isn't whiskey for slamming this isn't whiskey for you know a chaser with a pint you know this is whiskey to savor the flavor over time um and it's a sensuality and, and then as you know with most things sensual it's not wham bam mm -hmm. it's the other way around it's take a time and let it let it perform enjoy enjoy the performance um, so in, 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 you touched on this just briefly without actually saying it. And so you, you, you're, you're okay with the terms cuvee and you're okay with the terms terroir, which you're stealing from, I don't know, stealing, borrowing from, yeah, no, from I wine. Don't steal whatever you want. I don't care. Uh, um, you, you're right. Uh, 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 um, cuvee. I mean, what's a cuvee? Oh, Christ. Yeah, now you've got another, everybody going here. What's a cuvee? A cuve, une cuve is, a, um, a vat, a, a tank. And uh, in wine parlance, um, whatever was in that tank is a cuvee, the contents of the tank. And therefore, quite often, that is euphemistically used as a bottling. Mm -hmm. uh, um, so you can see the, you know, the, the, the origins of the term. Um, the Grand Cuvee, for example, of Krug, a great champagne that I've always admired fantastically. I mean, it was Remy Krug. Um, who, who, who was making the next bottling of the Grand Cuvée when I visited him many years ago in Reims, in Reims. And, 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 and it was his explanation to me that it was so inspirational, which was that, you know, for vintage champagne, well, it's the good Lord that decides on the quality. Mm -hmm. But for the Grand Cuvée, I'm God. <laughs> and I remember this so vividly coming from, from Remy. And, and I, it really made, it, it resonated that, yes, he is a, has taken these terroir-defined individual wines, you know, vinified and, and, and uh, you know, separately from each of these different origins, different soils, different microclimates, the, the Montagne de Reims, the Valle de Marne, you know, the Montagne de Blanc, uh, uh, um, you know, the chalk soils versus, you know, and each of these he's as assembled creatively, very carefully, um, to create the Grand Cuvée. Um, and that's what any great chef does. That's what, you know, the great Bordeaux do. And if it's good enough for them, it's good enough for me. 
you know, and, and you, you've you've hit this right because there's a, there's these these terms that don't have direct translations into the English language with mm. um, assemblage and melange and uh, terroir and cuvee. These are all maybe more appropriate terms, and you're specifically avoiding the term of blend, right? Because well, I've, I've, I've heard you it. hate that term. Right? I hate like, that word I hate, because, well, as you know, uh, um, mm -hmm. you know, the whiskey industry has co-opted these terms. So in Ireland. Um, you know, the, the, the whiskey industry has managed to co-opt an inanimate object into mm -hmm. a whiskey style, and I'm referring to pot still, right. uh, um, and blended whiskey, a blended whiskey, a blend. Well, yeah, yes, it's a verb meaning to mix things together, but it's also a style of whiskey, um, mm -hmm. of column still, silent spirit with flavorsome single malt whiskies added as sort of whiskey essence. Well, that's a style of whiskey, a legally determined style of whiskey. So, so sure, I want to get away from that term. Uh, um, so assemblage, assembling, marrying, mm -hmm. bringing together whatever you want uh, uh, um, in a creative way. Uh, um, and and that's, that's quite a job. And that's what Ned does. It's quite a job building this um, milfoy gato. That will get you again. That's a French term, a culinary term for a multi-layered cake. Uh, uh, um, yeah, sure. You're really putting my uh, high school French classes uh, yeah. through their courses. That's been, you know, 25 you know, the English years language ago. Is very good, very good at using uh, or borrowing portmanteau words from other languages that don't quite work um, or, or have an English equivalent. And that's one of the great things about our language. Uh, um, it's one of the very few great things about our language. My, my wife is a, <laughs> a language teacher and uh, English is, is not the greatest, most uh, understandable language. Um, so we've, we've create, you've created these cuvées, right? And the most recent one is the coffee. Uh, I think I said that right. Yeah. A Parisian painter, uh, a Parisian painter, uh, um, who he commissioned to, to, to produce the label uh, for this effect. It, uh, sort of Harlequin uh, um, idea of you know, this, this multi-malt uh, um, multi approach to, to creating the, um, um, the cuvee, uh, the, the, you know, the, all the different colors of the terroirs, you know, bringing them together. Um, and that's sort of, you know, we call that, you know, it's the Waterford. It's the Waterford Cuvée. Um, this version, the second, is Cuvée Coffee. Um, it will be with us for a good two years um, before we then uh, refine it into a third ver variant. And I was, you know, I was talking about this offline a little bit. Um, the packaging of this feels like some of the most appropriate packaging for for a whiskey that's like this, where you have this assemblage of different whiskeys. Um, but it, in 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 my experience, whiskey is a very um, social spirit, right? There's there's quite a few people that will sit at home and drink it alone, but it's a great thing. And so when I look at the packaging of this, not only is it representing that this is a blend, but it also looks like a community of people, right? There's a community of people that's existing in the art of it. And I like the idea of you know using art on these um, models because yeah. it allows you to sort of interpret however you want, you know. Well, you know, whiskey is is for sharing. Uh, uh, mm -hmm. uh, it is a sensual thing, or it can be. Uh, um, it, you know, you know that there are whiskies for different times and different moods and different moments. You know, you know I've always felt very strongly about that. You know, that, that there isn't a uniform thing. Uh, um, but but the, you know, the principle of the cuvee concept is to bring together uh, um, terroir-defined flavors the single farms, and stack them together. And remember, those single farms, they're not just single malts. They are single, single malts. Mm -hmm. From the ground to the bottle, they are standalone, single, single malts from Waterford. You know, Waterford is the distillery. The barley is coming from these um, myriad of different farms. So it's like having, you know, 110 Kilhoman distilleries you know, it, it farms, and we're, and we're bringing them separately to distill them at Waterford. So the cuvées are bringing together those single farms 
So there, you could really argue they are multi-single malts. Mm -hmm. um, but I mean, let's not go there. <laughs> just, just getting it to be able to confuse them. They just taste beautiful. Okay, it's mm -hmm. about complexity. What is the? How do you get the most profound, the most compelling, the most beguiling, the most sensual experience possible? That's what it's about. Mm -hmm. And I think, you know, there's there's some some homage for whiskey geeks here and that you have these cuvées, but they're coming from the individual farms. And so you could pick up some or all maybe of the individual farm offerings. Right. And so you can understand how <laughs> the components become greater by becoming an assemblage. Right. Um, because they're all fantastic on their own. But when you put them together um, like a group of people, Ooh. oftentimes they become better. Right. It elevates. Yeah. But this is it. The sum, uh, you know, the whole, the cuvee, the whole being even greater than merely the sum of the parts. You know, that's mm -hmm. that's that's the that's the principle here, uh, um, and, and that's you know that's the creativity, and that's what the cuvees are to us. It's it's creativity. The single farms are all about precision of place. There's nothing we do. You know, it is what it is. The flavor is what it is. We don't do anything. You know, the, 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 here are the flavor differences. We do nothing. It's the precision of place. Marvelous. Mm -hmm. and then we can be really creative. Uh, and with our library of 110, at we speak, 110 single farm origins, we can then bring these together to create an organic cuvee, uh, a peated mm -hmm. cuvee, um, and the Waterford Cuvée, Cuvée Coffee. So when you set out for this this most recent Cuvée that you've created, um, did the team set out with an idea of a flavor profile they were chasing, no. or um, no. you just sort of no. you know threw stuff against the wall and see what happens? No, no not at all. Uh, uh, um, no, in fact, the very first bottles we ever did, I remember Ned coming to me and saying, "Well, what, you know, what, what's Waterford meant to taste like?" And I said, "Well, you know, Ned, it is what it is." You know, we know the we you, know, you can deconstruct. We know the barley flavor is going to come because of the hydro milk. Uh, we know the terroir intensity is going to come because we pneumatically pressed every last drop out. We know the intensity of flavor is coming from that extended fermentation. We know the creamy middle is coming from the malolactic fermentation. We know the oily, rich, unctuous mouthfeel is coming from the very, very slow trickle distillation. You know, we know the purity is coming because we take a 10 degree middle cut. We're not greedy. We don't take too much. We take the purity, the best. OK. And we put it in to, I believe, the industry's greatest wood policy going. Right across the board, we do everything. Each farm, 200 barrels, each farm goes into the same profile right across the board. There is no shortcuts. There is no, oh, look at this. And then over here, you do something completely different. An old whiskey uh, um, magician trick. We do it right across the board. So more or less 50-50 uh, American versus French oak. Now, first of all, people go to say, wow, French oak? You know, uh, well, remember, before 73, before the 70s, whiskey in Scotland, in Ireland, was maturing in a large proportion of French oak because every wine came to the UK, came to Ireland, from France, from Spain, from Italy, in European oak. Simple as that. They came in barrels, not bottles. Uh, um, so it's not new. So French oak uh, um, or European oak, um, mm -hmm. American, some some virgin American, some virgin French. That's where the color comes from. Uh, first fill American. That's where the creme brulee, vanillary flavors come from. First fill French. That's where the spice comes from. And then the fifth grouping is is pudding wines sweet wines vdn we call it vin du naturel which is where the sucrosity comes from and that's the same for each farm and we list every barrel used in every bottling 
right down to the barrel, the cooperage, the origin, the percentages of the bottling, because the percentages of the bottling may not necessarily refer to the percentages I just gave you. Um, mm -hmm. That's that's up to Ned to decide. And, you know, I, I, I spent a little bit of time on um, the, the barreling process because um, I think one of the, the best things that I've seen in the last few years in North America is um, kind of revisiting French oak as a aging barrel, right? Because uh, it wasn't, it didn't play hugely in the North American marketplace. Sure. But once it did, I, you know, it's, it's just, it's a different flavor profile and it's, and it's amazing oh, yeah. flavor profile. And, and, you know, I, I like to see more and more of it, but I can see how each it's one dangerous. of these components. You've got to know how to use it. You've got to know how to yeah. use it. Uh, uh, I mean, yeah, it, very it can be the very point. divisive. Ah, the, the, you know, the staves are twice as thick as America. Mm -hmm. okay? And that's down to Quercus Alba versus Quercus Robar. Uh, Quercus Robar being Euro European, it has to be split. It can't be made the same way. The barrels are twice as heavy, twice as thick. Therefore, you've got to be really careful how you use them. Um, and it's about integration. And, and this is the thing about wood. You know, we all get our knickers in a twist about wood. You know, some distillers, oh, 80% of a whiskey's flavor comes from the wood. Uh, no, it doesn't. It comes from the barley. Um, and that 2,000 flavor compounds in the barley are in the new spirit. They're in the old spirit. It's what happens to them, those compounds, when they're in the barrel via the wood, um, the micro-oxygenation of those flavor compounds through the wood. The fresher the wood is, the more micro-oxygenation you get, the more maturation you get effect. That's more or less it. If you recycle the barrels again and again and again, well, you get less of it. They less, they're less mature. Um, so there's really no shortcut um, to, to actually buying decent wood, putting your hands in your pocket and buying the wood. People play music, ultrasound, they, they, they scrape them, they rechar them, they do all these sort of things, none of which is terribly effective. Mm -hmm. um, it's having a, a robust, uh, well-curated uh, wood policy. I learned this you know, back in my independent bottling days, Brook Laddie days. There's, there's, there's really no shortcut. Um, and, and having that ability, therefore, to choose uh, how you put your bottling together uh, from those variables at your disposal. So it's an organization. It's a financial thing, too. It's, it costs a lot of money. But, you know, what you shouldn't do is taste the wood. I, I mean, very simply put, if you want to taste oak, go and lick a tree. It's much cheaper. Yeah, there's there's a handful of sawdust out in my shop that you can just get a mouthful of that if you really want to Integration, integration. Mm -hmm. and the better the integration and the, the, the how you put these bottings together over time means you have a more uh, uh, you know a, 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 a philosophically integrated spirit, which means in the glass you've got a coherent, comprehensive spirit which you can now add water to it to your heart's content, you know, because we've reduced it to 50%. Um, so now you're adding water to release those flavors, to soften the alcohol um, and give you the mouthfeel that you are happy with at that time. So, so don't be scared to add water um, because you're not going to dilute the flavor and you're not going to dilute the texture. As much as it sounds sort of oxymoronic, you won't uh, uh, because it's so well integrated um, and that you will it will really open your eyes up to a new way of engaging with whiskey. I mean, personally, I, 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 I dilute mine 50-50 you know, um, because I just don't want the high, the, the alcoholics, the high, high strength. Um, and because I know that I can dilute it quite easily in the glass. Um, Without losing the texture or the flavor. So I've got a, I've got a, well, I've got a lot more questions, but I'm going to have to cut a few of them out. We may have to try to do this again sometime. But um, so you've you've got component parts going into the final blend, right? And so we have the ability to do this. And um, since you are a brewery turned distillery, have you ever considered taking some of the initial 
wort and making beer to then have alongside to the individual farm wards and then alongside the blends. That was one, one of the one of the restrictions I had with taking over the brewery was that we weren't to brew beer. Mm-hmm. So 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 no is the answer to that. And and, and and equally we've got we've got we've got enough on our plates, you know, you know, distilling. Yeah. It. It, it it's the question that, you know, all of the the people who don't actually have to do the work are gonna ask the question right because hey, this would be a super neat experiment, but also You've got millions and millions of euros invested in trying to be a successful uh, whiskey company. So why take the time to, to brew some beer, right? Um, you know, it, it feels like or it looks like on, on paper. I mean, you've, you've made some, some very, very smart business decisions. You're able to acquire a distillery for you know, less than 18% of its build value. And, you know, overall investment is less than 25% of its build value. You know, initially it's... And I don't see how you have a, you, you, it doesn't feel like you would have a hard time, you know, finding investing partners, right? Because you've acquired this capital property uh, pretty at a pretty significantly uh, low cost f- for what it would be to, to replace it. And then well, our, share, you know, our shareholders are, are, are all the people that have followed me from, from my wine days, uh, from Brooklady days uh, um, to here. Um, they sort of invested in me and my way of doing things. Um, mm-hmm. You know, really, that that's you know, and they're private, private people. Um, mm-hmm. So, so, so they they really, you know, um, how would you say it? I mean, they're 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 investing in a in a, in a philosophy. Um, yep. It's you know, it, and you know, it, it it looks on paper like you're you're doing them justice at this point because you have one of the most traceable <laughs> whiskeys one of the the best you know wood policies um your farming practices you know the fact that you have an agronomist on staff there are major distilleries that don't have that right sure sure. Uh, this this, this is all great Uh, um it's early days uh um it's not plain sailing you know we're an independent company uh uh, we're, 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 we're changing the mold we're changing uh uh the perceptions uh we're even you know changing the categories you know so so you know, we're sort of blazing a trail uh um and you know this is whiskey for the curious of heart the curious mind uh um you know we're not piling them high selling them cheap we're not trying to make the cheapest liter possible we're trying to make the most naturally flavorsome liter possible uh um so we're blazing a trail sort of going back to how it used to be uh, um, and you know, it's, it's, it's not for everybody. It's, it's, it's for the people that, you know, whether they're, you know, gastronomes and gourmets, you know, foodies, wine drinkers, connoisseurs, whatever you want to call them, people that are used to flavor and rejoice in flavor, you know, and, and, you know, they don't want to just accept the dumbed downs, you know, bland odor, you know, they actually want to. You know, they'll drink less, but they want to drink better and get more connected with where it comes from, how it was made, the values behind it, uh, um, and to understand it. Um, and that's what the Tewar Code gives that validation um, of what's in the bottle, you know, the verification of what's in the bottle, as well as, you know, validating, you know, what we're trying to. Um, show here in in the tech world you'd be called a disruptor right like what you're doing is is disruptive to to the natural process that exists among some of the the giants that are out there and that's a good thing right it's not perhaps the right word that exists Uh, the the natural process of the existing world is 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 perhaps that's the sort of misnomer because it's not terribly natural uh uh, um so so yeah yeah okay I, I, i you know i'm um, you know the big guys. I'm sure you know hate my guts. I know uh, um, you know they don't like um, you know it's their narrative. They've paid for it, and so they don't like someone else you know suggesting there might be another way of doing things. Yeah, and this, I mean, I think you hit on this, but this really feels like um, the brand, the whiskey, the the idea for 
um, the people that are really, really invested in understanding what they're consuming and in, in, in exploration, maybe they're not looking for commodity whiskey. Well, remember, yeah, remember absolutely. Uh, Brook Laddie in 2000, you weren't allowed in a distillery. You know, it, 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 you, you, they, they were off limits. You, you couldn't go into one. Um, and at Brook Laddie, the first thing we did was open the doors and, and welcome everybody in. And say, look, this is how it's made. Look, 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 this is how it's done. You know, you, I mean, you remember we put video cameras up and web cameras. We, you know, we've we've got web cameras too. You know, in Waterford, so you can see what's going on. Uh, 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 you know, transparency. Um, you know, it, it goes back to that thing about Tewa. You know, we can talk about Tewa to the cows come home, and I'm sure there'll be a lot of people in this industry that are going to co-opt that term. Because it's very easy to co-opt without actually having to do anything. And that's what our industry does. It sees something it likes, it goes, oh, I'll have that. And they'll 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 borrow it, you know. Uh, um so 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 I have no doubts that you know this term will be corrupted um and you know reduced to insignificance. Uh, that's the way this industry tends to work. Um, but it's no use. For me, just having a tower, I've got to be able to prove I've got it. I've got to mm -hmm. be able to show you. And I have to be able to be transparent about it. So I have to have the, the validation and uh, the transparency to share it. And that's what, we, yeah. that's what we print in the bottom of the bottles. It's, it's actually there in the glass, is that creed of tower traceable and transparent. Um, because it, it's, you know, real provenance is all of those things together, not just one of them. Yeah. It's it, the, the, there's a portion of your website where you have just kind of years on year on years on years of, of study of, um, you know, crop reports, you know, because there's, there's this projection that maybe 23 was not a great crop year for uh, most of the world and 24 likely is going to be similar, but um, most consumers stop at the what, right? Like, what am I drinking? But you guys are answering and you said the why, but I think it goes further than the why. It's the why, it's the how, it's the who, it's the when and the where, right? Yeah. It's all of those questions that a reporter is supposed mm -hmm. to ask, right? To make a personal interest story work. Mm. Um, you effectively have warehoused that information for any um, consumer to to self serve. You know they can they can come and, and discover this information, and for the people who are that curious, who are that interested, it, You're right? And and you know that Tower code, you know it, it's blockchain uh, data, a lot of it, mm -hmm. but there's also stuff in there which you know again reinforces, you know fundamental element that this is about agriculture that's where the flavor comes from it comes from that grain and how it grew and where it grew as it has done for the last 12 10,000 years you know so so you know to ram that home to ram it right home you can sit there with a glass of rath eden or you know dunbell or dunmore one of the single farms, you know, and you can listen to where that barley grew. You can, as you're drinking it, you're smelling it, you can listen to where it came from. And that is what I'm trying to do here, is trying to remind you it starts and ends with agriculture. That's what it's about. It's, it's, it's incredibly romantic, right? And so you're, you're, you're describing effectively the green noise that exists within the bottle, right? Um, the thing that is inherently soothing to a human's brain and pushing the absolute narrative that this is produce, not product, right? Um, produce, and, yeah, that's right. Only one lesser difference, uh, uh, produce. Uh, that's what it is, not a product. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. And, and, you, know, and, and you, know, I, you know, I love drinking whiskey out side anyhow you know so so <laughs> for me it's really you know uh, um whether it's a river bank or a sort of hunting lodge or a, you know i i i love you know, drinking whiskey outside uh, um or on a bench you know on a beach you know uh, um but i mean no it, it's it's again it's just trying to remind people um that it starts it always did it always used to start with the field mm -hmm. This this product, if you were in a grocery store, this product belongs in the section with the vegetables, not the section with the boxed macaroni. Like that's effectively what you've got here. 
Yeah. Um, and well, and, and I think it achieves that. It's single malt whiskey that's made in Ireland because it's the best barley in the world. Scottish double distillation. Uh, um, this is you know this is single malt whiskey, like it used to be. I, I appreciate the time that you've given me and, and I hate to cut it here because I have at least 20 more questions to ask. Um, we'll have to, we'll have to really revisit this sometime. I've, I've truly, truly enjoyed it. Um, I'll give you a couple seconds. If you've got anything else that you wanted to um, kick out uh, and then we'll, 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 no, we'll call it, it for the day. Thank you very much. I, I, I've thoroughly enjoyed it. It's been very, very good questions. You know, we've now got to, you know, having shown people the, 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 the ingredients, the, the single farm origins, we'll carry those on, sure. Uh, uh, um, but really now, now we, it's bringing those terroir-defined flavors together. Um, and we've done it you know, uh, um, with the cuvee, the Waterford cuvee, uh, the peated, um, which I think just got a double gold John Barleycon award, um, and the organic, and it just takes it into another le level. I, there's nothing else we can do. You know, this is, uh, but of course, remember, it's all getting older. <laughs> so, so, mm -hmm. yeah, this is just the beginning. This is step two, you know, of, of the phase. Um, it's going to get older. So, so, you know, watch this space. Yeah, it's a prime opportunity to get in on effectively the ground floor of this particular brand. Mm. And I'll have to keep my eye out for the organic and peated. I've had the single mm. farm and the and the cuvee, which the cuvee was, it, it's phenomenal. But it needs uh, time. Think, yeah. It needs time. You've got to give it time. This is mm. not, you know, just think of that strip tease. You don't pay the money and then go, woof. You know, it, it's about, you know, giving, Absolutely. give the thing time. Let it, let it sort of react to the air, to the water. And remember, we bottle these at 50. We fill, mm -hmm. we distill to 70. We fill the barrels at 70. All right. So mm -hmm. we start high. We then, you know, obviously it falls with time, but then we reduce it to 50 over three, four months. And then it's up to you in your glass to liberate that flavor with as much or as little water as you like. Now, you know, I know, you know, in, in America, it can be quite hot down south. Well, fine. Mm -hmm. If you need to add a little bit of ice, do a little bit of ice. But don't don't anesthetize it, you know, mm -hmm. uh, because you're just anesthetizing the flavor. Uh, um, you know, keep the flavor cool by all means. Take water from the fridge. And as I said, up to 50-50. Find, find your optimum. If, you know, depending on your mood, depending who you're with, time of day, how long you've got. And it just is a revelationary experience. It, 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 you know, the whiskey changes, it transforms in front of you. Uh, um, I mean, I mean, think of the bang for the buck that you get. You know, this isn't one whiskey in a bottle. This is multi effects in a bottle. Mm -hmm. let, let let it perform. <laughs> it, it's an entire experience, right? It's yeah. it's a it's a culinary experience in and of itself though. So, you get almost um, twice as much volume as you you, you, you would do you know, if, you, if you dilute it, but anyhow. Right now, now your, your, uh, your sales team is probably saying, Hey, stop saying that because it's going to make us sell less bottles because you're telling everybody to cut yeah. it so don't do that. Um, but, uh, it, it's a testament to the intent of the brand is, you know, uh, absolutely cut it because that's how we expect it to shine. And you don't hear too many uh, brands that'll say, yeah, you could take our hundred, uh, hundred proof whiskey uh, and cut it in half. And it's still going to be. Yeah, great. I know. I, I mean, try it just as an exercise. It's extraordinary. Mm -hmm. I, I'm not, I'm not yeah. saying you should, you know, that's the way I enjoy yep. it. Uh, uh, um, you know, a teardrop is the minimum. A teardrop mm -hmm. is the minimum. To get those that, that that reaction of the flavor compound group known as the aldehydes, they react with the water. Um, so, so a teardrop is the minimum to release those flavors. Uh, um, up to that, after that is is really according to your personal taste and, and as I said, your mood, uh, you know, time of day, you know, it, 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 how you like it. You know, um, I personally don't like drinking at fifty percent alcohol. I, I much prefer uh, lowering it. Um, and so that extra addition of water um, at the last minute in your glass is, is, is um, you know, is, 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 is think of it as a liberator. You're, you're opening up the flavors. Uh, um, and you're making it accessible. 
Yeah. I, I foresee a, an experiment in my future, in my very, very near future, where we're going uh, uh, to walk through a drop and a drop and a drop and just keep going until we hit you know, sort of the bottom of it. But yeah, and, um, and I, I don't mean, you know, you know, with pipettes and all that sort of anally, you know, no, just a little jigger of water and just add a right. drop. And then yeah. you know, it, you, does it taste a little bit, uh, add a bit more? It, you know, there's, there's no you know, precise thing. Of course not. No, it's a, mm-hmm. it's a, it's a mood thing. Well, that, that's good because I don't have, I don't have a dropper. Uh, oh. So it'll be, you know, whatever I can get poured in. So it'll be perfect. Yeah, but, you can't uh, overdo it. It's, it's not a problem. I really, really appreciate the time. Thank you again, Mark, for, sure. for hopping on this, this, sure. well, this afternoon for you this morning for me. Let's do it again. Absolutely. Let's do it again. All right, man. Good, good. So thanks for tuning in for this offering from the Embellished Podcast. If you enjoyed this, please leave me a review on whatever platform that you have to be consuming this on. Leave a comment if possible. Hit me up on social media at TikTok or Instagram using Embellished Pod and give me a follow so you can keep up with what's going on here. I can be found at www.embellishedpod.com with all of my links, accounts, contact details, and more. Thanks for stopping by today.